Hey everyone. So today we're going to talk about death investigation. Um, probably most people's favorite topic when it comes to forensic science is trying to figure out how, why, when somebody died. And I think that one of the reasons people are really interested in, in this is that all the rest of the fields of forensic science is used to figure this out, right? But the main person that does a death investigation in general, who we would say is the medical examiner, depending on if that's the in your state, if you have a medical examiner or a coroner. So the coroner or the medical examiner and their team would come to the location of the crime and collect the evidence they need. And they also typically would have the body taken to their morgue so that they could do an autopsy and actually do a, a thorough examination. All right, so back in the day when people are died, um, if you had a coma, if you, you know, if you were in a coma or you, you look like you weren't breathing or you look like you're sleeping, but they couldn't tell you were breathing, um, people thought you were dead. So people, people were buried alive a lot in the 17th century, which is super scary, which is where the, the little term called Saved by the Bell came from, which we know is a show. But Saved by the Bell, they used to bury people with a bell connected to a string that was in the, in the coffins. So if they woke up, they could jingle it and people could hear that they were alive. Um, to me, that would be the creepiest thing ever. If you, ever <laughs> if you ever heard one of those bells go off because you know somebody's alive in a casket somewhere and that's just really freaky. But that's literally what they did because they weren't sure how to figure out if somebody was still alive. Okay, so that's something I just wanted to start with that. So before we do this, we need to be able to define what death is. Right, so medical professionals have decided, um, doctors, people that are in, the, in, you know, lawyers dealing with this as well, um, and medical examiners talking about what do we, what do we actually classify death is um, physiologically, right, dealing with the body. So we have no circulation of blood, right, because the heart has stopped, which also means when the heart stops, there's no oxygen that's getting to the brain, so there's no brain activity. Um, these are different things that we could say. But people do disagree, which is why we're going to watch this little video about a person named Carrie Shivo, which is, it's really important to look at this. This is from the state of Florida. We always have interesting cases here. So I'm going to um, show you guys this case. We're going to watch it and then we'll have questions after it. over a sick patient's right to die, there has rarely, if ever, been a case like the one in Florida. In 2003, America watched as a private family struggle became a very public feud. Terry Schiavo's husband and her parents in Florida have been fighting for a long time about whether her feeding tube should be disconnected. And a personal battle eventually sparked a political firestorm. I'm asking you, you know, she's being murdered? An extraordinary session here on Capitol Hill. Tonight, this Congress is about to commit a travesty. Today, we're still grappling with end-of-life issues. But will scientific advancements help to clarify them or only make them more complicated? Some patients who appear to be entirely vegetative are actually quite the opposite. Terry Schiavo's case started long before the cameras appeared. It was February of 1990 when the 26-year-old suffered a cardiac arrest. She went several minutes without oxygen from her collapse and um, experienced a profound brain injury. In the first uh, couple days, doctors didn't know she was going to live or die. Lack of oxygen left Schiavo with severe brain damage and in what doctors call a persistent vegetative state, or PVS, a condition in which the parts of the brain that control thinking and awareness are damaged or destroyed. Only the brainstem, which controls basic reflexes like breathing, remains. Initially, Terry's husband and parents cared for her together, exploring potential treatments and rehabilitation. But four years after her collapse, Michael Schiavo says doctors gave him a grim prognosis. It was to a point where Terry wasn't going to function. There was nothing more, and they, and they told us her mother was sitting right there at the time. There was nothing more they could do for Terry. In 1998, Michael Schiavo petitioned to have his wife's feeding tube removed, saying she had told him and others she wouldn't want to live in this condition. 
Her parents, Bob and Mary Schindler, fought desperately to keep her alive, insisting that removing her feeding tube would be tantamount to murder. People think Terry was in a coma, she was brain dead, uh, that she was terminal. Terry was not dying. Terry had a, a profound brain injury, and our family wanted to care for her just the way she was. With no living will expressing her wishes, it was up to the state courts to decide Terry's fate. They went to court more than anybody has ever gone to court, in my experience, in fighting about an end-of-life care case. This was probably the most litigated case that I can think of. We were up and down the federal court system, the state court system, many, many times. At least 19 judges heard the case through various appeals, and the decisions were all ultimately in Michael Schiavo's favor, going back to the original court ruling that said that there was clear and convincing evidence that Terry would not want to be kept alive and that her feeding tube should be removed. She told me what she wanted, and the courts heard it over and over and over again. For Terry's parents, the legal decisions were devastating. They appealed to the media and the public. Please, please, please save my little girl. They became a cause. They got picked up by talk radio. They had religious groups weighing in on their behalf. Spare this innocent child. There was a fear across the board of euthanasia, assisted suicide, abortion, and abandonment of the disabled, if you will. That's what a lot of the motives were that drove those who rallied to the side of Terry's parents. To deliberately starve her to death is an act of cruelty and ultimately it's murder itself. Terry touched a nerve with so many people because they saw a family that was willing and wanting to care for her. They didn't understand why they weren't being allowed to do that. On both sides, Let Terry live! Emotions ran high. No, no one would want to live this way. 20 times before, 20 times. This is the Roe versus Wade of euthanasia. I used to say, what are these people doing? Why Terry? People's feeding tubes are removed every day. To this day, I don't know why, but it was very surreal. Should Terry Schiavo live or die? What evidence is there that this woman has any brain function or not? Michael Schiavo believes the media fanned the flames, especially after the Schindlers released a series of videos that they said proved Terry was conscious and aware. But Kaplan says the videos were misleading. It was irresponsible beyond belief that it was run unchallenged and unexamined. It was too attractive to the media not to use. Here she is. But it was assembled selectively, and it was staged, and it did not indicate what she could do. Kaplan says that what looked like intentional responses in Terry were just reflexes that are common in people in a persistent vegetative state. A lot of our bodily systems are run off that part of the brain that Terry still had. That tape used that fact and made it look as if she was thinking and feeling. While most of the doctors who examined Shivo believed she was in a vegetative state, not everyone in the medical community agreed. There's a total of about 14 specialists in brain injury and stroke, which is her situation, who have come out to point out that she's not in PVS, not in a coma, does respond, is alert, and actually has even the ability to communicate. With each side entrenched, arguments turned to threats. It's no fun getting up in the morning and looking under your car before you start the engine to see if there's a d device because you've had people contact you saying that they're going to blow you to bits if you keep working on this case. My house is invaded day in and day out. And these are people pushing their views on me. And I don't, I don't understand that. You have your view on things and you have your beliefs on, that's great. But don't stand outside somebody else's house and push that on them. And the more the fight played out in public, the more political it became. Who's going to look out for this girl's rights? We have to. In 2003, Florida legislators passed Terry's Law, which gave Governor Jeb Bush the authority to reattach Shivo's feeding tube. The tube had been removed by court order six days earlier. We did what was right, and I'm proud of the legislature for responding. The state law was eventually found to be unconstitutional. But in 2005, the fight moved to Capitol Hill. There are extraordinary events happening in Washington tonight as the U.S. Congress and President move toward passing a law before morning to intervene in the case of Terry Schiavo. By then, Schiavo's feeding tube had been removed again. If we do not act 
she will die of thirst. We will Conservative die. lawmakers led the charge to pass a law that would give Terry's parents the chance to continue their fight in federal court. These are extraordinary circumstances that center on the most fundamental of human values and virtues, the sanctity of human life. Opponents argue that politicians had no place interfering in personal medical decisions. Do we really want to insert ourselves in the middle of families, private matters all across America? This Congress should respect the law and the rulings of courts and not trample the Constitution. After a late night emergency session of Congress. For the relief of the parents of Teresa Marie Schiavo. The bill came to a vote. 203 yeas, 58 nays. The bill is passed. And without objection, the motion reconsiders laid up on the table. <laughs> The bill was then rushed over to President Bush, who signed it after midnight. But the law wasn't enough. A federal judge refused to order the feeding tube reinserted because he found the arguments were unlikely to succeed in federal court. The Schindler family kept appealing to no avail. And on March 31st, 2005, the long, painful public struggle was over. The end came this morning for Terry Schiavo, and her husband's lawyer says she died peacefully 13 days after her feeding tube was removed. Terry, we love you dearly, but we know that God loves you more than we do. We must accept your untimely death as God's will. Schiavo's autopsy eventually confirmed what had been so hotly contested for years in court proceedings. The damage to her brain had been massive and irreversible. Today, nine years after Schiavo's death, while we are still struggling with end-of-life issues, advanced brain imaging is helping scientists better understand the minds of people who are unable to communicate, and they're finding some surprising and unexpected results. It might be possible, in some of these cases, that what you see is not what you get. Dr. Adrian Owen is a neuroscientist who is using brain scans to search for glimmers of consciousness in patients who've been diagnosed in a vegetative state. He says it wouldn't have worked with Terry Schiavo, but his method has shown promise with some patients. Owen puts them in a high-tech scanner and asks them to imagine doing certain activities, like playing tennis or moving around their home. We're trying to get the patient to do something when we ask them to do it. But of course, they can't move because that's part of the, the diagnosis of vegetative state. And our, our question was, well, can some of these patients do it with their brain? I want you to imagine playing tennis only if the answer to the question is yes. Does your sister, Jen, have a daughter? We're going to start the scan now. Imagine. He looks to see if his question will activate a specific part of the brain. That's pretty good. I mean, he's got this whole band of activity. Stephen, we can see your brain lighting up when you're trying to answer the question. Even though the sample size is small, Owen's work has garnered attention from the scientific community. He found that nearly 20% of the patients he's tested, patients who meet the criteria for being vegetative, have shown signs of awareness, including some, like Stephen, who seem to answer simple yes or no questions using only their minds. For now... Owen is avoiding the toughest question of all. We really haven't got to the point of asking really tricky ethical questions like, do you want to live or die? And in part, that's because the appropriate ethical frameworks aren't yet in place for deciding what we would do with that information. Almost all of the patients who've shown evidence of awareness have suffered from trauma or blows to the head, not oxygen deprivation like Shivo. But Bobby Schindler says the extent of her injuries wouldn't have made a difference to his family. I think it's important to also understand that none of this mattered to my family in this battle. It didn't matter to us um, if Terry never improved from her condition. We loved her unconditionally. We loved her that way. The family. Okay, so this this case always makes me go back and forth on what I think. So I have some questions here that I'd like you to think about. Um, and, and depending on what they say and depending on who's speaking, um, and you may find yourself the same way and be like, oh, well, you know, they should pull her plug. No, they shouldn't. Um, the parents should be in charge. No, the, the husband should be in charge. So these are some things I want you guys to think about. So first thing is, did you guys catch, how did Terry actually end up in this vegetative state? 
what put her there? Like, what was the what was the reason she ended up there? And we'll discuss this after the after you guys watch this. Um, when a person has a heartbeat, are they alive even if there's no brain activity? So the add-on question to that, like, what do you think? Do they think you think it should be classified as alive? Then what if we were to couple it with the brain scans that you just saw? Um, would you say that if somebody had a brain scan that is active, when somebody asked them a question, that they should be classified as alive, even though they're in a vegetative state, right? Are they, see, because again, some people connect being alive with brain activity, okay? Um, if you had a, a heartbeat and no brain activity, would you want to be kept alive? So think about that. Um, not knowing if there's a, a way to come back from that and you're going to be like that all your life, um, you know, not knowing whether that would go, which would you be okay? Would you want people to keep you alive? So that's something else to think about, all these ethical questions. If you're married, like Terry Shiva was, who should determine if you are actually, if they're going to pull your plug? Like eventually, you know, um, the husband worked with her for four years and was able to see no progress in his mind. And he was, you know, ready to say, listen, she wouldn't want to live like this. She's not getting better. Um, I think it's time to pull her plug. And you saw the family at the end there. Her brother was like, we don't care what state she's in. We want to keep her alive. And I know you guys don't have kids yet, but this is a big question. You know, should you, if you have your, you know, when you have kids, that's going to be something that's hard to, to be able to say, you know, I'm going to pull the plug on my own kid. That's, that's a tough one. You can have, you can have this conversation with your parents and see what they would say, but um, it all depends on how well they think they know you. Right. And how well, how much they believe maybe that you could make progress and become better. So we're going to talk about some of these things after you watch us. Okay. So physiologically, we do talk about death starting at the very beginning being there's no oxygen. No oxygen leads to the fact that muscles and organs and brain, nothing's working anymore because you need to have oxygen to do that. What ends up happening because of that is this process called autolysis. And autolysis is your cells are literally breaking down to what they're made of, right? So they kind of come apart. That's how you know, they're going to start to decompose. So once death occurs, we, we can look at, there's five different manners of death. And when you look at a death certificate, there'll be one of these five on there, right? So the first one is a natural death. Most people, this is if, you know, if you died of something, you know, you were sick and this is, you know, you're an old person. And you've been attended by a, um, a doctor and they will look at you or whatever. And you had no other weird things happen. The natural death. Um, and you can just see what old age or disease. So accidental death. This could be literally like a car accident, falling off a ladder, um, you know, doing something stupid. I'd be accidental. You didn't die on purpose. Oh, I, I didn't realize I had falling from the ladder. That's funny. Um, suicide. We all know what suicide is. Suicide could be with a gun or, or um, overdosing, which, by the way, they tend to say that overdoses more often is, are suicides because they don't know that they're intentional, but they can't prove that they're not. So a lot of times, actually, I'm just kidding. That's, I have that backwards. They, ha they don't know they're intentional and they can't assume that unless somebody writes a note. But typically, a suicidal would be, um, I'm sorry, somebody that overdoses, typically, typically they make it, they classify it as accidental. Because a lot of times people overdose and it's accidental because they're not trying to overdose. They just maybe took more of uh, a drug or maybe it was more concentrated than they'd have in the past. For example, I remember when we used to go to the morgue, Dr. G would tell us about people, people in Orlando, um, people that are heroin users. So one thing that you guys probably don't think about is that illegal drugs, they're not like regulated like one other, you know, your prescription drugs are. So you might get a illegal drug, a dose of heroin that is like 5% heroin and other percent fentanyl or whatever. But then if you get a, a drug that's like 20% heroin, which is literally what happened in Orlando, um, there were people that were dying because they were just getting too much of it and they weren't used to it. They were using the same amount, but they didn't realize it was much more concentrated. So that's the type of stuff that, again, that would be accidental because, again, they don't, they don't, just because overdose doesn't mean it's suicide. 
Okay. Um, homicide is literally the legal definition of one person killing another person doesn't necessarily mean it's intentional. So when somebody hits somebody with a car, let's say somebody's crossing the street and you hit somebody with a car and you kill them, they call that vehicular homicide. So if it was intentional, then it would be murder. But it's it's a homicide if it's not intentional or if it's intentional. It could be either way. But notice murder is not a manner of death. So murder is more of a legal term. We use it to indicate motive, somebody did it on purpose, whereas a homicide um, is just somebody killing somebody else. And then there's always, always undetermined. So this, when I remember visiting Dr. G at the morgue, she would always say that an undetermined death is usually something like maybe you couldn't see the body when it was in its full, like maybe you just have the bones left and you can't tell like how the person died, which sometimes they can from the bones, but not always. Um, what if somebody, you get the ashes from a fire, but you don't know that somebody actually died in the fire. What if the body was just there and they were actually poisoned first? Uh, there's lots of things that you could say are undetermined. You're not sure why the person died. In the Casey Anthony case, which you know I always talk about, um, she, Dr. G did, re, did rule that a homicide because of the duct tape put on the child's mouth. And she would say, you never put that on that. But as far as the actual evidence goes, could they really determine that's how she died? Some people would say it's undetermined because there's not enough left of her to determine you know, why she died. It was just bones at that point when they found her body. Okay, so these are the different things that different manners of death that get put on the death certificate. All right, so what's the manner of death in this case? This is actually a case that Dr. G shared with me years ago. A man gets shot in the leg at the age of 20 in a gang-related altercation. This causes him to be paralyzed. Years pass, and he cannot get a job and ends up an invalid who is extremely poor. He later develops bed sores that cause him to get sepsis and die. Okay, so what you have to ask yourself as we go back to the last slide, you go through the different ones. Why did he actually die? Right? He died from the sepsis, but what was the sepsis? caused by it was caused by a gunshot that happened 20 years ago so dr g ruled this as a homicide on his death certificate so very interesting that it may be not super straightforward but you have to go back to the underlying cause okay so here's what it looks like on a death certificate and so the the cause of death here is very it's a little more specific and you can see here it says like for this actual one it's acute renal failure and then underneath it will be like um, conditions related or maybe unrelated um, that also could have helped contribute to dying right so the person has diabetes uh, they're in a coma you know kind of like Terry Schiavo as far as that goes she she was originally okay the mechanism of death now it's important to know the mechanism of get death gets very specific even more specific than the cause of death and this one is not on the death certificate, okay? Um, so a specific bodily change. So here we go. If the example, if the cause of death is a shooting, the mechanism might be uh, blood loss, right, due to maybe hitting an artery or loss of brain function. Um, if, the, if the cause of death is a suicide, the mechanism of death might be strangulation, right, or loss of oxygen to the brain okay so a little more specific all right how do we determine time of death we've kind of talked about these in the different other uh, fields of forensic science so estimating time of death would be we could use temperature right to determine how long it's been which we'll get in a second um, we can look at maggots that were on a body and try to figure out um, the PMI post-mortem interval right and we can also use things like rigidity. So when we examine the body, um, is it is it stiff? Like the mobsters used to call them a stiff. That's because of this thing called um, rigor mortis that occurs. Um, also the lividity, which I'm going to show you in a second what that is. But the blood pools to a certain location. So that occurs in a certain time frame. So that can help us determine the time of death. Another thing that can be um, help us determine time of death 
is stomach contents. Like if you know if somebody was eating a meal at a certain time, and then you can see how much of it's digested, we can actually figure out stuff from that. All right, so liver mortis, sorry for the gross picture, but um, when somebody dies, the blood cells, the red blood cells actually break down and they actually pool to whatever gravity direction is, right? So downwards. So if you're laying on your side, it would all pool to your side if you're on that side. If you're on your back here, you can see it pulls to the back and that's where you're getting that purplish color. Uh, what this is helpful in is we know when lividity occurs, it occurs within, I think about within two hours of somebody dying. So if once the lividity is fixed, the fix doesn't happen until about eight hours. So you can tell if somebody's been moved since they died, if they have lividity in more than one place more than one, one location. So that's helpful in that. Like if somebody's story says, oh, I found the body and here and blah, blah. You can refute somebody's story or confirm their story. That's what that can be helpful with. Okay, so there's some other pictures of this. So here's liver mortis is when the lividity is happening. And again, sorry for the gross pictures, but I wanted to show you. So for example, on the, on the picture on the left, the guy obviously had his arm across his stomach, right? When he, so until the lividity was fixed. So for the first eight hours he was dead, that's why the lividity didn't happen in that area because he had that pressure from his arm. And then it does start to disappear, you know, everywhere in the body after. It doesn't, it doesn't stay. We say it's fixed, it will be fixed for a while and then it goes away. Um, so again, it's something to note that just like with decomp, the hotter it is, the faster that occurs. The hotter it is, the faster lividity occurs as well or it'll, it'll set in. Okay, so again, you can tell somebody's been moved. I talked about that. Okay, uh, the other one that we talk about is rigor mortis. And again, this is why um, people that are mobsters used to call dead body stiffs, because the body does go stiff after a while. Um, and you can see the time frames here. So at the beginning, uh, and by the way, things will speed up. Rigor mortis can speed up based on its temperature, its higher temperature, or let's say you're exercising. But let's say you're running from the cops, right? And um, rigor mortis will set in quicker if you get shot by a cop and die because your ATP is used up and a rigor mortis will have an onset quicker, a quicker onset. Um, after about two days, the rigor mortis is gone. So it starts um, in your body, it starts in your in your head and moves, it moves its way down. And then it, it also stops in the head at first and moves its way down. So the larger muscles keep rigor longer, which makes sense. And there's a cow in rigor. It's not as gross as a person. So less than two hours, we don't have rigor mortis onset until it's been at least two hours. And then after 48 hours, there's not gonna be rigor. So you have to be determined from other things. If you find a body between this window, right, before two hours or after 48 hours, the way you can determine how long they've been dead has to be for another another way. It's not going to work to use rigor mortis because that's not going to be a thing then. So these are some different ways. You know, I'm going to give you different cases. You have to figure out, um, you know, how long the person's been there. Okay, so just, again, more time frames. Okay, so the reason rigor occurs, uh, because there's a lack of uh, calcium. I'm sorry, I always say the opposite. It's extra calcium that makes the muscles not flexible. I always say the opposite, I'm sorry. That's what I'm, I want you to know. It's extra calcium. I'm the chemistry teacher, I should know that. Um, but again, this is more anatomy, but still, that's a picture of it. Okay, and here's a dog playing dead. Um, but again, that's what he'd look like if he died in that position. He could be, you know, in rigor. Okay. Um, Lau, well, I already talked about this, but the reasons that are things that affect rigor. We didn't talk about if you're sick. So yeah, if you're sick and you have a fever, um, rigor will onset quicker. And also, if you're outside where it's hot, if you're if you're outside and it's cold and snowy, it's gonna um, delay the onset of rigor. Okay, so different things like that. Algor mortis. So this is another way that we can determine time of death is the the temperature of your body. And again, this has to be factored with and what conditions you're found in. You know, if you're found in a freezer, we're going to have to 
you know, take that into account. Or if you're found in the desert, like this picture, you have to take that into account as well. But for normal room temperature, um, you lose about 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit per hour for the first 12 hours. So if I take your temperature, assuming, again, you're finding now, now that we're doing all this testing for COVID, you're actually finding that people's temperatures, body, like resting temperature is not always the same. Not. And so, you know, 98.6 is what they say, but a lot of us are already at 94, 95, not 94, 95.5, 97.5, something like that. So it, there's a range that you could be. So it's kind of important to know what somebody was originally, not that you're always going to have that, but the, this is just a rule of thumb here. Um, and then eventually they'll, they'll reach the temperature of the surroundings, whether it's hotter or colder. So somebody that dies in the snow, they are going to have their body heat for a little while. And that actually, if you find a body quickly at, in the snow, that might be the best way to determine how long they've been dead because um, their body's still going to be warm for, a, you know, at least a couple hours. And so that might be an easier one to figure out unless it's been over that and then the body's like frozen. Uh, what is the best part of the body? Oh, what part of the body, sorry, is used to measure the temperature? So we do it rectally and the liver. Both of those are the best places to get uh, temperature. Okay, um, so your stomach contents can also be used to determine time of death. This was another case that Dr. G talked about where there was a little girl that was missing, was kidnapped, and they were able to determine where, so they had a video of her at a restaurant eating. Right. And they also were to able to determine how. Let me think about this. I don't know if they have video or not, but I remember they found a crinkly fry in the stomach. And they were able to know that in the in the area that she lived in where she was taken, only certain restaurants had those. And so then they were able to trace it back to that restaurant and look at the video footage. And that's how they were able to determine how long how long ago it was because they, they found that fry in her stomach. So very interesting that that can be used. Also used, obviously, in poisoning cases and determining, like, you know, when did you eat that food? Were you at home? Were you somewhere else or whatever? Okay. Uh, Dr. Bill Bass here in the picture looking at a, a body farm photo here. Um, this is just talking about the days and what happens for decomp, which we've, we've talked about before, but um, the different stages they go through and different things that you would observe for each, you know, set of days. Um, we can also, so we look at the decomposition process. We also look at forensic entomology, the maggots, the, the flies that are there, so we can determine post-mortem interval, how long has it been since somebody's died. Um, so decomp coupled with temperature, coupled with um, forensic entomology, those are all, that will all help us determine how long the person's been dead. And that's it. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop this so we can talk about the Terry Shivo case. All right, bye guys.